In this video, I'm going to share six of the most common mistakes people make when selling and how to avoid them. I'm Jeff Mowat. Over the 30 years that managers have been bringing me in to teach sales techniques to their teams, I discovered that when people blow a sale, it's not usually because they don't understand the fundamentals of selling. And the fundamentals of selling are uh, we establish rapport, we do a needs analysis, we present our different options, and we discuss next steps. And, and most people understand those fundamentals. Where we find people blow a sale is when they say something inadvertently that turns the customer off. It's kind of like if you ever watch those sports bloopers shows, it's where the uh, athlete scores on their own team. Now, the difference is, of course, in sports bloopers, the athletes know where they blow it. I mean, you can see them, they're devastated. They're just dying, thinking, oh, this is going to be on TV for the rest of my career. And that's fine for sports bloopers. But when we make a mistake in selling, we don't know what we did wrong. Was it our prices? Was it our product is the, not the right fit for them? Did I say something inadvertently? And the problem is, if we don't know what we're doing wrong, well, we can't enhance our success going forward. So in this session, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about six of the most common things people do inadvertently to mess up a sale. Oh, and here's a tip. Be sure to watch this video right through to the end, because I'm going to share a tip at the end that most people are not aware that they are doing. That is one of the most common ways we tend to blow the sale. Common selling mistake number one is what I call leading the witness. It's where we try to manipulate people into liking us or uh, hopefully buying our product. We're leading somebody and it has the opposite effect of actually liking us. Imagine this. It's the end of a long day at work and you're at home. Supper is out of the way and it is time for um, blanky cookie remote. Ah. Hello. Hello. Is this Mr. Mowat? Yes. Hi. How are you this evening? Good. Uh, just, just one moment, please. Uh, honey, it's for you. I only did that one time. Well, you've had those kind of calls. Well, when you think about it, you can imagine what put the person off at the receiving end of that call. At the outset, they asked, uh, is this so-and-so? And that's fine. But then they asked this simple question, how are you? Well, when you are phoning somebody that you haven't met and, and we ask the, the question, how are you? It has two negative responses. First of all, it sounds insincere. You're really calling to ask me how I am? We've never met, but gosh, really thoughtful of you. The second thing that does wrong in terms of putting the person off is it wastes their time. This is not a good way to start a relationship. In fact, if you're ever on the receiving end of one of those telephone calls, you might feel like going all Liam Neeson. If you ever call me again, know that I have a particular set of skills. I will find you. So suggestion, don't ask people on the phone, how are you? Instead, we'll get better results by asking, uh, hello, Mr. Smith. Hi, it's Jeff Mowat, JC Mowat Seminars. We've never met. The reason I'm calling, in other words, when you point out at the outset that you've never met, it helps build trust. So faking somebody into hopefully liking you doesn't work if instead we are upfront with them. In other words, uh, I had a, a colleague of mine, uh, Warren Evans, and he said to me, uh, he served as a mentor to me for many years. He said, the more you treat customers like they're smart, intelligent adults, the more receptive they are to your expertise, your products, or services. And what that means for you and me is when we're making a sales call, if you can assume that they really understand their business, their industry, which they probably do, we're going to have better success. And by that assumption, I mean that if they, are, they have enough money to buy from you, it means that somehow they've had some success. So maybe they're a smart person. Or if they're buying on behalf of their company, well, then their company has entrusted them to make buying decisions 
so they don't, what's the expression, suffer fools lightly. So the more we use terms like, well, you probably already know that, or you probably experienced this, or um, maybe you know this, but some of your team members would benefit from that or something like that. The idea is that you show respect for their knowledge. We don't try to manipulate them. They're more likely to go along with us for the rest of that buying conversation. Common selling mistake number two is what I call listening too quietly. Now, by listening too quietly, I'm referring to, yes, we listen, but we're not seen as being strong listeners. Now, as I say this, you might be thinking, oh, hey, Jeff, I got this. I'm a good listener. I take notes. I pay attention. I, I incorporate whatever the prospect's needs are into the proposal, that sort of thing. Well, here's the irony. The longer you've been at selling, the less you may be seen as being a strong listener. And that's a good reason why people may not buy from you. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, you can apply this idea of not listening well, not only to your prospects, to your potential customers, but also your personal relationships. And, and I share this from, uh, unfortunately, uh, my own past examples of this with, uh, with my wife. Now, years ago, when our daughters were only uh, eight and 10 years old, right now they're 18 and 20 years old. But when they were kids, they took biathlon lessons, which you probably know biathlon is um, the cross-country skiing and the, and the shooting lessons. Well, it was uh, my wife Lydia's turn to go pick them up. Uh, on the way, however, uh, there was a bit of a, a snowfall and along the way, uh, somebody in traffic had a bender bender and so, Traffic was so backed up that Lydia was 15 minutes late picking up the girls from biathlon lessons, which you think, okay, no big deal. They can, the kids can wait, have fun, you know, play. Well, as it turns out, as you probably know, depending on, on the age of the kids, they don't just let kids go after class. You literally need to sign them out, which meant in this case, the coach is standing in the outdoor biathlon track, flanked by our two daughters, holding the sign out clipboard. And when Lydia arrives, coach says, uh, yeah, uh, we really need you to arrive on time. I have exams I need to study for. Uh, just so you know, when it comes to pickup time, we have a three strike policy. And unfortunately, that is one time. So just want to let you know that... Uh, uh, two more times than that, then we'd have to withdraw the, the, the girls from the program. So we'd really appreciate if you were here on time. All right. So fine. So later that night, uh, Lydia is explaining this to me. And, you know, I, I, I want to listen. I, I'm, I'm trying to be a good husband. I, I don't interrupt her at all. Uh, I turn the TV on mute. So at the end of this, she explains this. And my response was, well, why did you take Memorial Drive this time of day? That's always busy. Why wouldn't you take Sarcy Trail? Was that wrong? Well, I, I thought about this later because I had some time on my own. It occurred to me what I probably should have said was something along the lines of, sounds like you had a rough day. I might have got a hug. I might, I might have been rewarded. Instead, I discovered our dog snores. This is more information than I needed. I should have said the two words that would have made me at least appear to be a good listener. I should have said those two words that I just mentioned to you, and that is sounds like. And what that means for you, the reason that they're so powerful is when you listen to your customer, to describe what their needs are, and you finish that up after you listen to them with, okay, it sounds like you're looking for this. It sounds like, in this case with, with Lydia, you know, it sounds like you had a rough day. It proves that you understand them. Yes, you're probably a good listener, but you may not be seen as a good listener because you may move right to solution and that gives them less confidence that you have been listening. However, when you use the word sounds like, then the prospect knows you've been paying attention to them. You understand them. If they talk with anybody else about this need, they take a risk and the risk that other person, that other salesperson may not understand them the way you've proven you have. So we need to listen louder. And by listening louder, just use the word sounds like more often when you're talking with your customers. And that prevents common sales mistake number two, listening too quietly. Let's go to common selling mistake number three, and that's 
trying to outdo the competition. Now, at some level in your needs analysis, you're going to determine what that customer is using. Maybe they're using a competitor right now. And the temptation is for us to what kind of bad mouth the competition. But you got to think of how that comes across to the customer. I had an example of that uh, when I was a customer myself years ago. Um, we had a garage door with a spring on the garage door that had uh, broken. So I called in a garage door repairman to come in and fix the spring. So while he's there, he uh, talks about the spring, replaces the spring, and then he looks up at the garage door motor mechanism and he said, oh, you must have got those at such and such a big box store. He said, those things are very good. Now I'm sitting there going, um, okay, I guess not, but I installed it five years ago myself and it hasn't given me a bit of problem, but basically that repairman insulted my intelligence in making that decision. And I, the question I'd, I'd ask myself later is what was the upside for him? All I thought was the guy was being uh, patronizing to me. And I actually, I didn't believe him. I thought, man, man this thing has lasted longer than the, the one I had before that. So he lost credibility. So the, the, the temptation when people mention the competition is perhaps to take a jab at the competition. There's no upside to it. Uh, it makes them, the customer, look like they've made a bad decision. That customer could be related to your competitor. It makes it look like a cheap shot. So my suggestion is when you are talking with a customer and they mention the competition, maybe it's okay to say, okay, you know, that, that's a good company. And in these types of scenarios, they're really good. You know, that type of an approach to solving your problem works really well. And then when you get it, when it's time for you to present what, what makes you not, not better, talk about what makes you different. Say, you know, the challenges in your unique circumstances with what's going on with you, we're taking a slightly different approach from that conventional approach, which is fine for most applications. And so what we can do is we can show ourselves to be different than competitors, but not necessarily better. Much more impactful to be different instead of better. There's no need to badmouth the competition. Common selling mistake number four, selective hearing. And by that I'm referring to at some point, a customer is going to describe some of their preferences and some of their buying objections, so to speak. And when it comes to us presenting our options, we oftentimes, as salespeople, we pretend that we, we didn't hear them. We kind of gloss over those objections. So, for example, uh, I know uh, I've been doing this now for 30 years to providing sales training for folks. And for many of those years, I'd get people talking about bringing me in to train their teams. And often one of the objections was, you know, we have a lot of our salespeople or our service people are scattered geographically. So for us to bring them all together, it's kind of hard for us to do logistically. It's also expensive for us to do. And so my response to that typically was, okay, well, that's fine. We can uh, go ahead and get as many people as we can together. And I'll bring in my videographer. We'll create a uh, recording of that so that we can train other folks who aren't able to make it. Well, that's a less than ideal solution. And for years, the last several years at least, there's been options to do this via video, but I resisted them because I didn't really want to set up a studio and all the rest of that kind of thing. So, But COVID forced me to get up to speed on that. And so the problem was I was losing a lot of work because I just give them an option that kind of ignored their real needs, the real problem, which was they're so dispersed geographically. And so now when I'm talking with our potential customers and they talk about, hey, we've got people who are spread all over, my response is, hey, and we also understand that you've got people who are spread geographically, therefore, I'm happy to conduct this on a Zoom or Teams meeting. We can put this together. We can, we can record this and create a program for you that's going to work for you. And so when you say in your proposal that you understand what their needs are, even if you can't actually uh, solve that need, but you say, okay, I understand you're looking for something that would be a little bit cheaper. Here's what we've done to save you money over the long term or less expensive, whatever that is. Just point out that, hey, I know you preferred the such and such a color. Um, so we've decided that we don't have that one available, but because this will do this, it will work uh, from a color point of view with these other colors. At least it shows that you are listening to them. And that's a way of, uh, well, it's overcoming that other uh, 
objective that they have, and that is selective hearing. So make sure that when you do propose what you're going to propose, that you do indicate you understood what their objections were. And that way they don't feel like they're being ignored. Common selling mistake number five is what I call being a smarty pants. And being a smarty pants is trying to be an expert in lots of things. And we find this happens for us when we feel somewhat insecure about our expertise, or maybe we're relatively young uh, compared to our customer, or we're trying to prove ourselves and it just doesn't work. And so I give an example of a, a different approach to doing this. Uh, years ago, I remember hearing our mayor, I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I remember hearing our mayor, Dave Bronconier, um, respond to a question about uh, oils, oil wells being dug around the city that, of Calgary. And I remember his response to that interviewer, Mayor Bronconier said, I don't profess to be an expert in the ins and out of the petroleum industry. What I do know is that Calgarians are looking for an environment that will do such and such. In other words, what, what made him so credible was he started off by saying, you know, I'm not trying to be an ex, I'm not trying to profess to be an expert in the oil industry. What I do know is something about Calgarians, and he is the mayor, he should know something about it, I suppose. And so, in other words, if we can be quick to admit that we don't know everything about everything, it, it could be, you know, they start talking about, I don't know, sports, hockey, and, and we go, you know, I, I, I didn't watch the game or I don't follow hockey. You, you, who won? You tell me, sort of thing. It can be as simple as this. It was when a customer walks in the door and you're looking out the window and you can ask them, so uh, how's the weather out there? Is, is it as cold as it looks? And that, that person gets to be an expert and they go, well, yeah, I just came in and uh, yeah, I know it's sunny out there, but it's really, ch that makes them feel like the expert. And, and again, the more we, we show our respect for their expertise, the more receptive they are to ours. So rather than trying to be a smarty pants about all things, try to show uh, uh, that you're respectful, that you understand what their, their expertise is. You may understand the, the ins and outs of running a company like that. Our focus is on this aspect of the machinery. Simple way, here's what you bring, here's what we bring to make them more receptive to us as a salesperson. I hope you're finding this information to be useful. Speaking of which, before I get to my last tip, if you're liking the information on this video, I think you're going to love my 30-second tips. You'll get them for free at jeffsbusinesstips.com. So whether you're using this information to enhance your own skills or you're coaching somebody else on your team, I think you'll find that to be a helpful resource. Again, that's jeffsbusinesstips.com. This last selling tip might surprise you. Well, ironically, we find that the longer you've been at selling, the more we tend to focus on the buyer itself, the economic buyer. And that's the big mistake, selling tip number six, and that's focusing on the bag of money. Now, I'm using that term because a colleague of mine, Tim Brighthub, talked about the economic buyer being the person who's actually making the ultimate buying decision. They're the one who are financing this purchase. And yet the person who's buying it may not be the biggest influencer. A colleague of mine, professional speaker Donald Cooper, told me that before he became a speaker trainer, he had a retail store in Canada that actually won several retailing awards called Alive and Well, which sold women's clothing. Now, the interesting thing there is it was focused on women's clothing. He often had working moms come, on, come in with their children. So because they were with their children, they're trying to shop and uh, carrying sometimes toddlers or babies around with them. What uh, Donald had arranged to do was they built a full scale like pirate ship kind of play area for the kids so that while the mom was shopping, the kids could be amused. They had somebody there to supervise them. It was just a great experience for the kids. In fact, he told me, he said uh, there was one little boy. Uh, They're about to leave the store. And the little boy looked up at his mom and said, Mommy, can we live here? Donald said the mom kind of looked down and said, yes, we can. You stay here. I'm going home with my shopping. No, didn't say that. But the, the lesson was that 
in Donald's store, in a women's clothing store, they also paid attention to the influencer. And the influencer in this case were the children. So obviously, moms, women with kids loved going to this store. And so did the kids. The kids be asking, hey, can we go to that store again? Well, what a great way to build your business. And so if we take that into our service Maybe you're providing a service to somebody. Keep in mind who the influencers are. I mean, you can imagine uh, if the uh, economic buyer for a traditional wedding might be the what father of the bride. Well, can you imagine if the wedding planner, maybe it is Philippe, the wedding planner, all he does is pay attention to the father of the bride and says, yeah, what would you want to do for the flowers? And we ignored the, the mother of the bride and the bride herself. Well, I can imagine how that Philippe might be, uh, au revoir, uh, bienvenue un autre fois, we come back another time. So pay attention to the influencers. And so one of the questions I would encourage you to ask when you are helping that customer making a buying decision is simply ask the question, is there anyone else who's involved in this decision who it would make sense for us to invite into this conversation? Now, let me just repeat that. Asking the question, is there anyone else who's involved in this buying decision who it would make sense for us to invite to this conversation? And also I use the term make sense as opposed to you want to, would you like to? Those are what kind of mood they're in. We're just talking about a logical resolution to a problem. Easy way for us to feel like we are including the people who need to be included. And that is sales mistake number six, focusing on the bag of money. Okay, let's do a quick recap of the six top sales blunders that turn customers off. And as I go through these, I want you to think of yourself as a customer and ask yourself, which of these six turn you off the most as a customer? I'm going to ask you to post them in the comments section below, if you would. Selling mistake number one is leading the witness. It's trying to convince them that you're their best friend. Hey, how are you today? That kind of thing. Instead, just be honest, focus on being upfront. If you're on a sales call, a cold call with somebody on the phone, rather than ask, how are you? Say, we've never met and then get to the point. Selling mistake number two is listening too quietly. Yes, you pay attention to the customer, but then to let them know that you've understood what they've said, make sure you use the two words that prove you are a good listener. Sounds like, okay, sounds like you're looking for such and such and looking like that helps them know that you understand them. Sales mistake number three is trying to outdo the competition or bad mouthing the competition. Instead, it's okay when a customer refers to a competitor, talk about, yeah, for conventional approaches, that's, that's a reasonable approach to use that are a good company. Uh, the reason we're taking a slightly different approach is because with your unique circumstances, we're trying to address this and this and this. Sales mistake number four, selective hearing. And that means that we gloss over the objections instead of what we should be doing. And that's letting them know that we've heard their objections. We've heard their preferences. And whether we can satisfy them or not, we're taking them into consideration with whatever we are offering right now. Sales mistake number five, being a smarty pants, trying to be all things to all people. We're better off talking about at the outset things we don't know. Maybe even it's about the weather. Maybe it's something about their industry that we're not expected to know. The more respect we show to their expertise, the more receptive they are to ours. And finally, sales mistake number six, and that is focusing on that bag of money, the economic buyer. The fact is there are other influencers. And one way to make sure that those influencers are there and present at that meeting is to ask, is there anyone else involved in this buying decision who would make sense for us to invite to this conversation? Let me just close with this. I believe that too many sales techniques are about being pushy. We need to just show respect and good manners. Talk less, listen more. Allow your competitors to blunder their way out of their customers' good graces and send those customers into your capable hands. Here's to you not dropping the ball. 